Hello. In this presentation, I mentioned many things that can go wrong with the base station installation. But don't let me worry you with all the factors I mentioned. Because most of the installations we make have no problems at all. Knowing these factors, however, will enable you to design a site to avoid problems. While it's not a factor that can be controlled, electrical noise around a site must be considered in system design. And there are many man-made sources of noise, including machinery, electrical signs, power lines, RF heating devices, and automobile ignition systems. Automobile ignition is probably the worst factor in cities, since there are many of these automobiles, and they may be fairly close to the site. And there are natural causes of noise, too. Uh, these include lightning, cosmic rays, uh, corona discharge from the tower or antenna during electrical storms, or noise from charged dust or rain striking the antenna. Noise is most intense about 25 megahertz, and it gradually decreases in strength with increasing frequency. It's quite severe in the 30 to 50 megahertz band in cities, and it's still a major factor in the 150 megahertz band, and it will cause some reduction in receiving performance even in the 450 megahertz band. The 800 or 900 megahertz bands have very little noise and seldom show any reduction of receiving performance. When noise affects a radio system, the usual indication is the talkback range from the mobiles or portables is much less than the talk out range. And the range difference is not explained by differences in the transmitter power. Noise interference at a site can easily be measured by a simple procedure. First, the 20 dB quieting sensitivity is checked on the receiver in the frequency band of interest. Simply connect the receiver directly to a signal generator, calibrated signal generator, and find how many microvolts uh, into the antenna connector are required to quiet the background noise by 20 dB from the no signal value. Next, the receiver antenna port is connected through this isolating T connector to a 50 ohm resistor. This isolating T connector is uh, simply a modified T connector that's had the pin removed so the only capacitive coupling exists between the signal generator and the receiver. And this prevents the signal generator impedance from affecting the noise level coming from the antenna. So first, the 20 dB quieting sensitivity is checked with the receiver antenna line terminated here on this 50 ohm resistor. Now because of the loss of this, this ISO-T connector, this might be in the range of 500 microvolts. So we'll write that down someplace. Now change the receiver line so it's connected directly to the antenna on the tower. Noise received by this antenna is going to overcome the signal generator contribution here, and 20 dB quieting is no longer going to be seen in the receiver. So to find how serious this noise problem is, the signal generator output should now be increased until 20 dB quieting is observed again and note the signal generator setting now. Perhaps it's something like 5,000 microvolts, and note that this is 10 times the 500 uh, microvolts required when the antenna is not connected. So we can say that the sensitivity of the receiver has changed by 10 times due to the noise. Instead of the usual 0.5 microvolt receiver sensitivity, because of the noise, it has an effective sensitivity of 10 times the 0.5, or 5 microvolts. And this can make a big difference in the receiving range. Theoretical range calculations will have to take this effective sensitivity into account, since using the rated sensitivity from the catalog sheet would give a misleading result. The measured noise will vary with the height of the antenna and also the automobile traffic density. So if it is a proposed site that you're considering, be sure to measure it under conditions as close as possible to the final installation. Transmitter spurious outputs occasionally cause an interference problem, and harmonics are probably the best known of these transmitter spuriouses. Harmonics are multiples of the transmitter output. A 150 megahertz uh, transmitter will have some power output at 300 megahertz, the second harmonic. 450 megahertz, the third harmonic, and 600 megahertz, and so on up into the microwave spectrum. 
Harmonics don't normally radiate very far then, since they may be more than 70 dB down from the transmitter carrier power. But we do have to consider their effect on receivers at the same site. You can easily predict harmonic interference with a calculator. Simply multiply up the transmitter frequency several times and see if any multiple falls on or very close to some receiver frequency at the site. If it does, recommend another frequency. Harmonics are difficult and expensive to cure by using shielding and filtering techniques. Some transmitters use a low frequency crystal and multiply the crystal frequency up uh, to generate the output frequency. For example, a transmitter may have a 12.5 megahertz crystal oscillator and this could be followed by a doubler stage which uh, is followed in turn by a, uh, uh, another tripler stage and eventually you get to the 150 megahertz uh, output frequency. So each one of these multiplier stages could radiate a weak signal and if there is a receiver at the site tuned to the multiplier output, interference could result. Not only the multiplier output frequencies, but every harmonic of the crystal might radiate from the transmitter. So with this type of transmitter, multiplying the crystal frequency to see if uh, any of the crystal harmonics fall on a receiver frequency at the site is the procedure to use. And if it does, recommend another frequency. Since these spurious outputs are, are rather low in power, their effect on the receivers uh, doesn't extend much more than uh, the transmitter site itself. Receivers may hear transmitter signals that are nowhere near the receiver tuned frequency. Sometimes they may even hear a transmitter operating at a different frequency band. This might be due to a spurious response of the receiver. And basically these result when the incoming signal mixes with the receiver oscillator or some harmonic of the receiver oscillator to produce the IF of the receiver. Sometimes the undesired signal enters the receiver through the antenna and as sometimes it radiates directly into the chassis of the receiver. For, to reduce problems in this last case, it's important that the receiver on a crowded site be well shielded. Now the top of the line Motorola base stations are shielded. All repeater models include shielding. However, the MSR station, the non-repeater station, uh, the shield kit is an option and it should be specified if this is to be installed on a crowded site. Desktop stations are not designed to be used at a crowded radio site and so are not equipped with complete shielding. Probably the most serious type of interference encountered in mobile radio systems is intermodulation. Uh, intermodulation, sometimes called intermod or, or simply IM, can be caused by two or more, sometimes more signals, combining together to produce interference on a receiver frequency. And there are several types of intermodulation. The most serious is called third order. And here's an example of a third order intermod combination. Suppose there are two transmitters operating at the same time. Transmitter A on 150 megahertz, transmitter B at 150.025 megahertz. These signals may combine in some electrically nonlinear circuit to produce new frequencies. The second harmonic of frequency B, which is 300.050, may combine with frequency A, 150.0, to produce a difference frequency which can cause interference on 150.050. A simple formula to describe this is 2B minus A equals C. The sum of the coefficients in this equation, 2 plus 1, is what determines the order of intermodulation. In this case, the sum is 3, so this is a third order combination. There's also another third order possibility. There could be a combination of 2A minus B. Twice frequency A which is, uh, is going to be 300 megahertz, could combine with the frequency of uh, 150.025 to produce a difference frequency of 149.975. So if a receiver was nearby on this frequency, this intermodulation product could cause serious interference. In both of these cases, notice the differences between the contributors and the resulting intermod product. 
In these examples here, the spacing is 25 kilohertz, equal differences. That's the way you can predict a possible intermodulation problem. Look for the equal frequency differences. The examples given here, the differences were 25 kilohertz, but they could be 1 megahertz or more. There could be an intermodulation problem with frequencies of 150, 151, and 152 megahertz. If there are only a few frequencies at a site, it's possible to see these equal frequency differences. But where there are many frequencies, it may not be obvious, so computer programs have been written to calculate them and print out the combinations that fall on receiver frequencies. Third order intermodulation is the most serious since the contributors are close in frequency. And this makes uh, any problem more difficult to solve since the filters are less effective at these closely spaced frequencies. There are other types of intermodulation that should be checked uh, also when you're designing a radio site. Another one is fifth order. This is where the combination might be 3B minus 2A equals C. Now the coefficients, as you see, add up to 5, uh, which describes the fifth order combination. Consider the last example where uh, frequency A was 150 megahertz and frequency B was 150.025. Three times frequency B is 450.075 and two times frequency A is 300 megahertz. So the difference between these two may be formed in some electrically nonlinear circuit and this difference frequency is 150.075. So this happens to fall on a receiver frequency at the site interference can be heard. Notice the frequency separation between the contributors and the intermodulation product here. There's 25 kilohertz between the contributors, but 50 kilohertz between the contributor and the intermod product. This two to one difference in spacing indicates a fifth order combination. And there are higher orders also. Seventh order has 4B minus 3A combination, Ninth order has a 5B minus 4A combination. But these higher orders are less of a problem normally since the losses in generating them are higher and the intermodulation products are not as strong. The even number orders, second order, fourth order, are seldom a serious problem because there's considerably frequency, considerable frequency spacing between the contributors and the resulting intermod product. This makes it fairly easy to solve the interference with filters if it does occur. An example of a second order that has occurred is a combination of two VHF stations, could be UHF also, with an AM broadcast station. The AM transmitter is usually within a few kilometers of the base station site. Second order is simply an addition or subtraction of the two frequencies. If there is 150 and 151 megahertz base station in the vicinity of an AM broadcast transmitter operating on 1,000 kilohertz, say, it's possible that the 1,000 kilohertz can add to the 150 megahertz frequency and produce an intermod product on 151 megahertz. And the reverse can happen also. The 1,000 kilohertz can subtract from the 151 megahertz frequency to produce interference on 150 megahertz. When this type of interference occurs, it's often due to inadequate grounding in the VHF or UHF base station. Another type of intermodulation that's encountered occasionally requires three transmitters to be operated simultaneously. Since this is a uh, form of third order intermodulation, it's called three transmitter third order to uh, distinguish it from the two transmitter type. Suppose the following frequencies are in use at a site. Transmitter A, 150 megahertz. Transmitter B, 150.025. And perhaps a mobile, uh, transmitter C here, drives very, very close to the site and is transmitting on 155 megahertz. What may happen when transmitter A and B are operated together, they will create a 25 megahertz difference frequency in some electrically nonlinear circuit. This different frequency may add to the mobile frequency, 155 here, to produce interference on 155.025 megahertz uh, at the, some receiver at the site. 
the difference frequency could also subtract from the 155 megahertz frequency to produce interference on 154.975. So it required three transmitters operating simultaneously to cause this problem. It requires two of them to produce a difference frequency and a third to which this difference adds to or subtracts. This type of intermodulation will most likely occur at crowded sites where the frequencies are paired and all of the transmitters at one end of the frequency band and all the receivers are located at the other end. Trunking sites might experience this type of intermodulation when several repeater transmitters are operated and a mobile or a control station places a very strong signal among the receiver frequencies. The strong signal might be heard on several receiver frequencies as a result of the intermodulation. I've mentioned that uh, intermodulation mixing occurs in some electrically nonlinear circuit, and there are a lot of them. There are several of them that can be at a site. Receivers uh, can generate and are sensitive to intermodulation because the mixer circuit must be nonlinear in order to accomplish its desired function. However, transmitters that have their antennas closely spaced may also generate intermod. Power from one transmitter may travel back down the coax of the other and it can mix in the final amplifier of the transmitter. The resulting intermod goes back up the transmission line to the antenna and it might be radiated out over a rather wide area. Then too, experience has shown that uh, there are many other items outside either the transmitter or the receiver that can generate and radiate intermod. Any two pieces of metal at a site that are, are making an imperfect connection might mix and, and radiate the intermod. A small bit of corrosion uh, where the metals touch acts like a semiconductor, which is certainly electrically nonlinear. Such things as tower support wires, tower joints, corroded antennas, air conditioning equipment on building tops, and many, many other things have been found to radiate intermod. Well, you might think at this point the the situation is hopeless. What can be done about all this? Well, I would suggest that the best procedure is take steps to avoid the intermod in the planning of the system. Recall that the frequencies that cause intermod interference have equal differences between them. And there are computer programs that are available that will search over a number of frequencies and, and print out the combination that might uh, cause intermod. So a computer analysis is made of existing and proposed frequencies at a site in the planning stages. And perhaps uh, frequencies can be chosen that will avoid the intermod. A two transmitter third order combination that occurs at the same site is probably hopeless. It will occur. Plan on it. The only way to clear the problem is to change one of the frequencies involved. Filters, uh, antenna spacing, uh, might be able to reduce the three transmitter third order intermod to a reasonable value. In the case of transmitter intermodulation, antenna spacing and filters will reduce the intermod radiation to a legal level, but you may still hear the interference at the same site. Well, suppose it's too late for that. Everything's been installed and interference has been reported. Now it can be done. Well, if the receiver is the source of the intermod mixing, anything that reduces the intermod interfering signals in coming into the receiver will help. A resonant cavity on the receiver antenna line uh, will allow the desired signal to pass, will, uh, will attenuate any off-frequency signals that cause the intermod. Uh, these cavities, these filters, are only effective when the contributing signals are more than a few hundred kilohertz from the receiver frequency. Any closer than that, and these cavities are not able to keep out the undesired signals. Another type of receiver filter that's uh, available only in the 30 to 50 and 150 to 174 megahertz bands is the crystal filter. Uh, this filter is very selective, and it can provide useful attenuation to undesired signals that are only perhaps 25 kilohertz away. Another possibility for clearing receiver intermod is a simple attenuator in the receiver line, receiver antenna line. This will give greater attenuation to the intermod than it will to the desired signal. It's known that the intermod generation process is a nonlinear process. 
That is, the intermod that's produced varies more rapidly than the strength of the signals producing it. It turns out that in receiver intermod, the strength of the interference in dB varies 3 to 1 more rapidly than the strength of the contributors. So, a 3 dB attenuator in the receiver line will reduce the desired signal in the intermod contributors by 3 dB, but it will reduce the intermodulation by 3 times this, or 9 dB. So in the case of a marginal problem, that might be enough to clear it. I should tell you, however, that uh, this relation works the other way, the opposite way also. Any amplifier gain that's placed ahead of the receiver will make things worse. Motorola offers an optional receiver preamplifier to increase receiver sensitivity. Now, these are not recommended for use on crowded sites or in large cities where intermodulation might be encountered. Their gain will amplify the intermod contributors and make the interference worse. They do work for mobiles and base stations that uh, will be operating in areas of low electrical noise with few other radio systems nearby. With several receivers, where several receivers are used on the same antenna, it's customary to use an RF amplifier to make up the losses in dividing the power to the various receivers here. Uh, these amplifiers should have no more gain than is necessary to overcome these power dividing losses. Excess gain in this arrangement can increase any intermodulation interference. Two transmitter third order intermod has a certain sound to it. It sounds like two people talking at once. One voice is loud, distorted, the other one sounds normal. The reason for this is the second harmonic is involved in a 2B minus A combination. The FM deviation is multiplied up by the harmonic, so a second harmonic is deviating plus or minus 10 kilohertz if the fundamental frequency is deviating plus or minus 5 kilohertz. This higher deviation makes the result sound loud and distorted in a receiver. The other contributor has no harmonic involved, so it sounds normal. In the intermodulation product, uh, you'll hear the combination of these two. Intermod mixing in the final amplifier of transmitters, as mentioned before, can cause the intermod products to be radiated out over a large area and government agencies uh, often have regulations as to how strong this uh, intermod can be. In the USA, the government considers uh, transmitter intermod to, to be the same as a spurious or harmonic and must meet these rules governing uh, spurious and harmonics. For a 100 tra watt transmitter, uh, the intermod must be at least 63 dB down from the 100 watt level to meet legal uh, restrictions. However, Motorola wishes to have some margin over these uh, rules. So Motorola recommends that the site be designed so transmitter intermod is at least 70 dB down from the transmitter power output. Now to do this, it's necessary to know the transmitter intermod mixing loss. This is simply the dB ratio of the power coming into the transmitter antenna port and the intermodulation power coming out. So uh, in this example here, if you have one watt of power coming from some other transmitter at the site, and if you have some resulting intermod coming out at the one half watt level, then the mixing loss would be 3 dB, 2 to 1 in power. This mixing loss depends on the transmitter design, and so it's different for various models. Information on this uh, might not be in the manufacturer's specifications, but it's usually available on request. It might vary from 0 dB for older solid state transmitters to 5 or 10 dB to modern equipment. The MSF 5000 transmitter has a 20 dB mixing loss for the UHF version, and it has an option to raise this to 70 dB on UHF and VHF. Transmitter intermodulation depends on both the mixing loss and the level of the incoming signal. The incoming signal can be controlled by the antenna spacing between the transmitters. So in site design, the transmitter intermod suppression of 70 dB should be equal to the sum of the transmitter mixing loss plus the propagation loss between the two antennas. And this propagation loss can be found uh, in charts or graphs 
uh, some of which appear in antenna manufacturers' catalogs. Horizontal or vertical antenna separation can be used, with more propagation loss available with vertical separation. If antenna spacing is not enough to give the required isolation, then a resonant cavity filter might be used on each of the transmitter lines. These will attenuate the incoming signals and will also attenuate the outgoing intermodulation. However, I should tell you that cavities are only effective at filtering frequencies that are spaced uh, more than a few hundred kilohertz. For closely spaced frequencies, there's another device that can be used. This is the ferrite isolator, which you see here in diagram form. It consists of a ferrite circulator, which is made of an iron ferrite material, and it's subjected to the field of a permanent magnet inside. The action of this magnet allows the radio signals to pass only one way through this isolator. The energy from the transmitter arrives at the isolator, and it goes around in the direction of this arrow here, and it leaves by the first connector that has a 50 ohm impedance. And this happens to be the antenna connection. The loss to the transmitter energy through the isolator is quite small, typically in the order of one half a dB. Energy coming back down the antenna line from a nearby transmitter is going to arrive at the isolator and it will travel in the direction indicated by the arrow and it will leave by the first 50 ohm impedance. In this case, it happens to be a 50 ohm load resistor. So most of the reverse power is dissipated in this resistor and very little of it gets back to the transmitter where it could cause intermodulation. Typically, an isolator can provide at least 20 dB of isolation to the incoming energy. And this 20 dB can be obtained at any frequency separation, even the same frequency of the transmitter. If this 20 dB is not enough to reach the 70 dB intermodulation requirement, isolators can be combined and their isolation added. Isolator manufacturers offer two and sometimes three isolators in the same package, as you see here. So a three isolator package can furnish uh, perhaps the full 70 dB necessary for transmitter intermod suppression. Using these in transmitters could allow transmitting antennas to be very closely spaced. By the way, the load resistor on the isolator closest to the antenna should be capable of dissipating the full power of the transmitter. Normally it doesn't have to do this, but if there's a fault with the antenna or the coax line, then all of the reflected power is routed to this resistor. The other resistors on the isolator here may use small one watt size resistors since the first one is going to absorb all the reflected power. Circulators are slightly nonlinear in their characteristics and they will generate small amounts of second harmonic uh, from the transmitter power. This can be reduced by a small filter which is either part of the circulator or sometimes it's an option available from the manufacturer. There are other things that have to be considered in designing or placing equipment on a powdered radio site. Receiver desensitizing and transmitter noise require attention in your recommendations for a site. But these are very large subjects and these will be discussed in our next program on site design.